everyone. Um, my name is Ellen Schenk, and I am the Community Engagement Librarian for the State Library. Thank you for joining us today for the second of several State Library Rare Collections virtual open house events. This event is being recorded and will be available throughout our website or through our website after the talk. If you missed the first session about publishers findings, it is also available on our website under that Lunch and Learns page. The State Library Rare Collection Room and Vaults are housed in the historic Forum Building in downtown Harrisburg, which is undergoing extensive renovations. We have a temporary library in the Keystone Building in downtown Harrisburg that is now closed to the public due to COVID, but we hope to be reopening in summer of 2021. While the library is closed, we are offering reference services over the phone or by email and our contact information is on that website. We will be offering virtual programs throughout 2021, so check our website for events throughout the year. Today, I'd like to introduce Michael Lear, the State Library's Rare Collections Librarian, as he delves into topics on book preservation and history during this virtual Lunch and Learn presentation, um, and we're doing these over the course of the year. Each session will highlight an aspect of items preserved within the vaults of the State Library of Pennsylvania. This presentation gives an overview of the 18th century book in America from British imports to American printed works and the role of the printer, bookbinder, and bookseller. Technology and production methods will also be discussed, including papermaking, printing, and binding. Examples from the State Library's collection will be shown. Michael Lear became the Rare Collections Librarian at the State Library in September 2019 after 20 years at Franklin and Marshall College Libraries Archives and Special Collections, where he organized, cataloged, and digitized materials and assisted students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the public in accessing collections. With a lifelong interest in history and material culture, Mr. Lear holds a master's in history and museum studies from the University of Delaware and a master's in library science from Clarion University. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Lear. Thank you, Ellen. All right, is my mic on? Just to check one more. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. okay, I just wanted to check because sometimes I hit the wrong button. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, thanks, thanks, Ellen and Nicole for inviting me to speak at this series. As, as uh, Ellen mentioned, this is the second presentation this year. I'll be here on a quarterly basis. The next presentation will probably be the end of July sometime. On the second presentation, I will talk about the 18th century book and printing and publishing using representative examples from the rare collections. We will concentrate on British and American publishing since of course we have a primarily have an English language collection. And one of our particular strengths is 18th century British and Pennsylvania imprints since Pennsylvania was of course a British colony in the 18th century. We also have what is known as the assembly collection. And these were books purchased by the colony from Britain in the 18th century for the use of the unicameral uh, provincial assembly. And these books actually formed the core of what was later created as state library in 1816. Today, we will explore the characteristics of 18th century printing and the book trade in Britain and America, technology and components of printing, the 18th century media landscape. And we will also see some highlights of state library collection, these being used as representative examples. 18th century printing, of course, fell in the hand era of printing, which was from 1450 when Gutenberg invented movable type and developed the printing press into the 1820s when mechanization started to change the way printing was done. This era was an era where binding, book selling, and printing could be separate trades. The publisher could be a books, could be the bookseller, the author, the printer, or another party. The concept of modern publishing with one entity responsible for the production of an entire book was not yet developed. That, that wasn't until the 19th century. Uh, this was an era where the bookseller, printer, or publisher 
was reluctant to invest too much capital in books and often printed a work only after gathering subscriptions, which was a vow to purchase the completed item that was made by customers through depositing money up front. There was a different economy of scale during this period. It was not generally not profitable to produce more than 1,000 to 2,000 copies of an item due to the expense of materials and the extra labor uh, cost, as well as tying up type for a longer period, wherein the printer could not print faster uh, turnaround jobs that were more profitable. In addition, a publisher would not normally commit to having all copies bound due to the upfront expense. The bookseller may have some copies bound for ready sale, otherwise books were kept in sheets for sale to others to have bound to taste. By the 18th century, Britain had began, began surpassing other European countries in output and quality, having been behind France, the Low Countries, Germany, and Italy in publishing and printing before the 18th century. Domestically made paper and type started flourishing in Britain in the 18th century. Publishing and copyright. Copyright in the 18th century is not quite what it is today with worldwide with the Berne Convention, worldwide conventions on copyright. Piracy and pirated editions were common in the 18th century. However, the English did establish a copyright law where the author held copyright that was established in, 18, in 1710. In this example shown here, there's a special copyright that was conveyed to the author of this work by, via an act of parliament for a period of 14 years. So in order to, to print, to set up a print shop in the 18th century, you had to have capital, type, a press, paper, ink, and labor. In fact, type was 66% of the cost of setting up a shop in the 18th century. 66% of the cost was invested in type. Paper, we'll talk more on that later. The press was five to 15% of the cost of setting up a print shop. Ink was relatively cheap, just being carbon linseed oil. And labor, as I mentioned earlier, the extra labor cost for larger scale production was not profitable. So there was a certain economy of scale that was different at that time, where between 1,000 and 2,000 copies of an item were generally printed. And this was due to the fact that the compositor who set the type was paid per job and they incurred no extra expense if they did a larger print run, but paper would have cost extra and press men whose labor was piecework would have been an extra expense that would have made it more of a losing proposition, ironically, for printing a larger run. Uh, the labor, the work day would be six days a week, 12 hour days. And in general, a good press man could print approximately 250 sheets per hour or 3,000 in a 12 hour day. As I mentioned earlier, subscriptions, uh, so pre-sale was, pre-sale of a work was a hedge against loss and it also helped finance the purchase of materials. Paper, in fact, made up 50% of production cost. So therefore subscriptions would be issued where someone would pay upfront half the cost of the book and then they'd pay the other half upon receival of the finished book. So this uh, ad ship from the Pennsylvania Gazette shows proposal for printing a concord concordance to the Bible, it contains a description of the book, when available, the size, the cost and where it would be sold. In the 18th century, generally the price was three to five times the actual production cost. And in this case, this book is selling for five shillings. And that includes the binding in this case. This, this ad is interesting because it talks about what happens if there are not enough subscribers to make, make it a safe bet to print this work. Uh, the subscribers money would be refunded and they could not get the book at the reduced price through subscription if the publisher had to take the risk on his own. So he would set a new price. 
And also, this is fun because it has buy six copies of this map, get the seventh free. And subscribers list were, were often published in books, naming the people who had pre-purchased the book, subscribe to it. And it could actually be prestigious for the buyer because you could be listed in, in uh, elite company. So in this case, you can see several colonial governors are listed at the top. And then the first person under, Ad, under A, Adams, John Adams Barrister at Law Boston purchased this English law book, this book on English laws. So printing, printing was accomplished by the use of type and it was a relief printing process. And so one way you can authenticate an 18th century item is look at, look at there should be indentations of where the type was pressed into the paper and makes an impression. So here you can see the back side of this broad side with the, the type pressed into the paper. The anatomy of type. So as I mentioned, type uh, letterpress printing at this time was a relief process where the character is raised on the type. And uh, by the 18th century, type was foundry produced. English printers had initially used Dutch made type until the 18th century when William Kay's Lawn type foundry opened in Britain in 1739. So most English books in American printed in the mid to late 18th century were printed using Kay's Lawn type. Uh, type. Each character was, nine, was 0.918 inches tall. Not sure where they came up with that number. That's the height of the type. Type was made from an alloy of tin, lead, antimony. Uh, the, these metals are easy to melt and cast, but hard enough to last a while. And type was made using Roman fonts and Gothic fonts for German pr printing. The Gothic font was derived from medieval handwriting style or paleography. The Roman font was developed by Venetians Nicholas Jensen and Aldous Minutius from Renaissance handwriting style. So here's some, here's some images of producing type. You had to make a, a punch for each character. And so the punch is in relief and that's on the upper left. And then on the lower right, you uh, use that steel punch to, to make a, a uh, incised or a con concave impression into a softer metal and that was your matrix. So you can see at the bottom right of B, uh, probably on a copper matrix. So the, ma the matrices were inserted into this holder and then on the uh, lower left, you can see melting the typesetting metal and then that would be poured into that form and then create the 0.918 high sort it was called so then you'd have it back in relief again in your typeset method and then there are there are actually a lot of uh, terminology a lot of common expressions are attributed to the printing trade so a sort was your your different characters so if you ran out of sorts while while setting a job then you were out of sorts and then the uppercase and the lowercase, those were the cases where the capital letters were held in the uppercase and the lowercase held the small case letters and hence the term upper lower case. And then also mind your P's and Q's, lowercase P's and lowercase Q's were easy to confuse. And I'm not sure why they don't have an expression for B's and D's because that seems similarly easy to confuse. So we have our type, so now we need paper. Paper was originally imported from Holland and France to Britain and America until domestic industries were, were created in the 18th century and uh, the written houses near Philadelphia being an early paper mill in America. So here you can see in this image, the lower part of it is the wire frame that's used to make paper. So it's a, 
you have your vertical chain lines and they're spread further apart. That's a larger gauge wire. And then you have thinner gauge wire that's woven in between. So you have this wire screen and then on tops what's called the decal. So that will hold your pulp from running off the mold, off the screen when you're during the paper making process. So different size sheets were actually produced and these have a whole terminology of their own. There was fool's cap, which was eight and a half by 13 and a half sheet of paper. Demi was 17 and a half by 22 and a half sheet of paper. And you can see example of paper making, which was labor intensive, intensive, varied in quality and uniformity, depending on the quality of your rags used to pulp, uh, used to, that were pulped to make the paper, usually linen, cotton rags. Woman on the left is using a mold and deco to gather pulp to form a sheet. The man in the middle is doing what's called couching, which is dumping the sheet off the mold. And these are placed, each sheet's placed between felts that the man on the right's gathering. And then when you get a large enough stack, then it's put into the press on the right to squeeze all the water out of it and consolidate the pulp into a sheet. Uh, these, uh, these molds also had what are called watermarks. So here you can see a watermark in this Italian paper. I may have this inverted. I don't think it's upside down. I may have it inverted, I'm not quite sure. And then you see the chain lines, the wider space lines in it and the, the laid paper effect. And here's an example of a, of a maker's name in the watermark, the other side of the sheet. So between the two, they're called marks and countermarks. Here's an example of a deco edge. This is some pulp that seeped under the frame used to hold everything in place. And so in this case, this book was bound and this, the deco edge was left and the sheets are untrimmed on the edges. So we have, our, we have our type and our paper. So now we're ready to begin printing. And that has to be done through composing the type into lines and sentences and paragraphs and pages. So the type was set using a composing stick seen here and it had to be upside down and backwards. So it would be a mirror image and be correct when you printed it. There's a scene from a composing room where the man on the left is using his composing stick to form a line and then each line he finishes, he places in a larger holder called a galley that's laying up above on the upper case. Then the man on the far right is taking these galleys of lines of type and forming them into paragraphs and pages in, in forms. You can see a form on the lower right and then he's actually what's called planing, he's using a wooden block and hammering all the type down flat. So everything's on the same plane when it's printed and you don't get letters that are darker or punch their way through the paper when it's printed. So this, this part gets a little bit complicated. The next part, so the man in the last image on the right doing what's called imposition where he's taking all those lines in paragraphs and forming the pages. So in position, you use chases or forms to contain lines of type and several pages per sheet for books. This was a more efficient use of paper and labor to print multiple pages on one sheet on both sides. These several pages were printed at once and were laid out in an order in which several pages of the book could be created by folding correctly into gatherings or signatures. The number of pages per sheet correlated to the size or height and width of the book and the expense to produce. So a folio would be consist of two leaves or four pages. This is what's called format. Quarto, four leaves or eight pages. An octavo, eight leaves or 16 pages. Duodecimo, 12 leaves or 24 pages. So if if the above was all from the same size sheet, less paper was needed to produce a Dewey Decimo than a folio and thus it was less expensive. So here in this illustration, you can see the, 
the forms at the top. And then the next image down, you can see a folio imposition where you have two pages on each side of the sheet. So you have, and so it's folded once. So you have uh, two leaves essentially, but then you have a total of four pages, two on each side of the sheet. And then the next the third image down is a quarto where you have four pages on one side of the sheet, four on the other. And when you fold it up, you have four leaves or eight pages. And then the lower right is an example of an octavo where you have eight pages on each sheet, on each side of the sheet or 16 pages overall. And then when you fold that up, then you have eight leaves. And here's an example of type set up in an octavo format, eight pages per the side of the sheet. There are exceptions, of course, however, where there's something called half sheet imposition, where instead of printing eight pages on a side, you got eight pages on a side and eight pages on the other side, you would use a half sheet. So you'd print four, you'd have, you'd have two sets of fours that were different and then you flip the sheet over. So then you cut it in half. So then you would have eight pages overall, but it's still called an octavo. So that's a little tough to explain, but there is there are exceptions to some of these like generalities. That's the main point. Uh, catch words and signatures. Here you can see on the lower right of page 25, the word excuse in the corner there. And then on the upper left of page 26, the word excuse. So they'd have these catch words on one page to tell you what was the next word on the next page. And that was an aid in keeping all your pages in order and folding all your sheets correctly to form the sections of a book that were put together. And this, this was a holdover from the days when they didn't number the pages. So you didn't have the numbers necessarily as an aid to putting the book together, or the numbers might be added as the book was being laid out. And then you also have here an example of signature marks. So here you see in the middle on the lower part of page 25, a D, and then 26 is blank. So then 27 would have a D2. And then, and then the next two leaves would be blank and then it would skip to the pages would be numbered E. So that's an example that indicates this book is a quarto. Uh, so four, and in this in this case, this is the fourth gathering of this book. So pages one through eight have an A on them. Pages nine through sixteen have a B, and this is pages twenty five through thirty two have a D. So then you'd have these sets of these sets of folded sheets that would make up as in a quarto would make up eight pages all together. And so you'd have a series of these eight pages that you'd stack up and sew together to form your book later. And, then, and here's an example of an octavo sheet. This is, this is just a pamphlet. So it's just one sheet rather than a gathering of multiple sheets as you'd have in a book. So you can see how pages at the top are upside down. And then when you fold it over, then everything's oriented correctly. And then it's folded another two times to, to make it a continuous uh, run of pages in order. And in this case, another indication of uh, format is the direction of the chain lines at paper. So a quarto chain lines generally run because of the way it's folded printed and folded, chain lines generally would run horizontal. In the case of this octavo, the chain line should run vertically. So as I mentioned earlier, this, this, the format has an impact in the expense of a book because you could get, for a duodecimo, you get 24 pages on a sheet of paper as opposed to four pages in the case of a folio. So of course the duodecimo is gonna be a lot 
less expensive and it's going to be smaller in scale because of the number of times the pages are folded and, and a folio of course is a larger book so here you can see exa an example of how important that was for people to know that time period so here's a list of books being sold by franklin folio quarto octavo Here's a diagram of the press. The press was called the Common Press, the Gutenberg Press, the Franklin Press. So this was in use from around 1450 to the early 19th century. Here's an example of inking and printing. So inking up the type and putting paper on the tempum and running it through the press. Here's an example of typography that is uh, the style and appearance of printed mat matter. So this is a handsome title page with red and black ink, various size fonts, italics, and devices. Printing illustrations in the 18th century was a separate process from text printing. It was an intaglio process engraving. Uh, There's a design that was etched, that was uh, incised into a copper plate provide greater detail and relief blocks than relief wood blocks. Used a roller press because of the pressure needed to pull the ink off the plate. And these illustrations are later bound in the book during binding, they're called plates. Here's an example of a plate. You can usually tell an 18th century plate, the ink will feel slightly raised because it was pulled up out of and incised grooves in the plate. You can see a plate mark on the outer four edges of the pressure used to apply the ink to the paper, and they're single-sided. Sometimes they were hand-colored. Here's an example of a hand-colored plate. The, the plates were bound into the book during sewing, ideally in the correct spot in the text. Here's an example of a plate. The lower right, they actually provide directions to the binder telling them what this plate went opposite of page 672 in volume one. Here's 672 where that plate resides, so they actually bound it correctly. And here's another method where the list of plates was provided to allow the binder to bind the books, but bind the plates in the right order within the text. So now, now that we've seen the process, that was kind of the most complicated thing to explain. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to find. Now we've looked at the technology and process involved in printing in the 18th century. Let's look at the nature of 18th century communications. Print was the media landscape along with handwritten correspondence and records in the 18th century. It was the era of an enlightenment, there was a quest for knowledge and increasing literacy, and that stimulated publications on science, literature, philosophy, etc. There are various types of publications produced in print in the 18th century. And these are roughly in the order of their longevity or ephemeral nature. You know, some, some items were made to not really be kept or last very long. There's broadsides, forms, legal documents, currency, Newspapers, weekly newspapers, almanacs, periodicals, prints, maps, books. Broadsides, here's an example of a broadside that's a legal, they could be legal proclamations, uh, public sale advertisements or vendues, entertainment posters. This is a legal notice broadside printed on one side. Usually these these were ephemeral and be thrown away once the topical issue passed or whatever they related to or advertised, except in the case of Pennsylvania German broadsides, which were printed as keepsakes, such as Letters from Heaven, Hal Segans, or songs. These were often framed, placed on a wall, or tucked away. The weekly newspaper, published weekly because of the time needed to set type and collect content. Newspapers contained a large number of ads. There was no reporting on news in the modern sense, 
but there were firsthand accounts uh, in newspapers that are published correspondence of people writing to each other about different areas of the world and different things going on. So they could often be biased. Here's an example of pamphlets, religious pamphlets uh, were, were popular, uh, current events were popular. Here's an example of a, a sermon preached by one of the, one of the main Great Awakening uh, clergymen and evangelical movement concurrent with the Enlightenment, the Great Awakening. Here's an example of a topical or current event item. This is Thomas Paine's common sense that encouraged the United States to seek independence from Britain. Here's a report of the Pennsylvania Hospital. This was printed by Franklin and Hall. Almanacs were popular among farmers, contain wit and wisdom, weather forecast, astrological and astronomical observations and practical household hints. So this is Poor Richard's Almanac, which was created by Benjamin Franklin in 1732. He wrote it until 1758 as Richard Saunders. Here's a German American Almanac containing the same types of materials, but then you see a transition from the 18th to 19th century the earliest German almanacs contain old world stories and folklore. And later you see the process of acculturation as they pick up more stories about the new world and the new country that they're in. Legal forms. This form is an engraved form, which allow for a fancier script than you could get out of type. Periodicals, the 18th century saw the rise of the magazine which is a French word for storehouse. Here are some titles. We have the ones with asterisk markings on them. Uh, the Gentleman's Magazine was actually the first English magazine to use that term, magazine. And the last two were short-lived American produced magazines. Books, all sorts of books were published in the 18th century on religion, philosophy, classics, literature, poetry, et cetera, et cetera as you see here on the list. Religion was a very popular topic in the 18th century. Here's an example, the first American printed Bible in English. Britain had suppressed the American press from printing the English Bible. And so it was done after the revolution, 1782, Robert Aiken, Philadelphia. The first English translation, direct English translation of the Quran occurred in the 18th century by George Sale in London. There had been an earlier English translation taken from a French translation that wasn't considered very reliable. So then the Sale edition came out. We, we, don't, have, we don't have an example of this one, but we do have the 1833 first American printing of Sale's Quran translation. Here's the uh, Solzbach Haggadah printed in 1755. Jewish works in Hebrew printing flourished in the Netherlands and Germany in the 18th century during what some call the Jewish Enlightenment. This Jewish Seder text is from Germany. Being a Quaker colony, we see a lot of pro and anti Quaker works in Pennsylvania. You know, many of these were printed in Britain, but also in America, they were, were both pro and anti-Quaker works. There's an example of pro-Quaker work, anti-Quaker work. Classics, translations of classical literature. This is considered the finest example from Franklin's print shop. This uh, translation of Cato Major by Cicero. Literature and poetry. This book's the first published poetry by an African American author in, in America. Phyllis Wheatley, a slave from Massachusetts. It was actually published in London as Boston publishers would not publish it. She was emancipated soon after publication and later wrote a poem dedicated to George Washington and met him at Cambridge in 1776. 
There's an example of works of Milton, classical, cla uh, older English literature continued to be published in the 18th century, of course, Shakespeare as well, and contemporary literature as well. Unfortunately, we're lacking a lot of 18th century British literature since we were uh, more of a legal library in the 18th century. So we don't have that legacy in our collection. Here's an example of the Journal of the Proceedings of Congress, uh, American Revolution document. Here's a treaty with Native Americans. And this was printed by Benjamin Franklin, his role as pro official provincial printer of Pennsylvania and has the Penn family coat of arms. The arts, here's an example of theater, uh, a, a show that was to have been on Drury, La Drury Lane in London and, set, and now it's in, and the British English, there's a particular pronunciation, Suddick, I think. I'm not sure if this is Suddick in Philadelphia County or if it's on the South Bank of the Thames, this example. Architecture, here's neoclassical or Georgian architecture was published in the 18th century. And of course, this would provide inspiration for many buildings in colonial America, including the what later became Independence Hall. Medicine, Benjamin Rush's account of the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793. Franklin's experiments and observations on electricity, especially this kite experiment is featured. This was first published in 1751. We have the fifth edition. Technology, this is Oliver Evans' Young Millwright Miller's Guide, published in 1795. Uh, Evans revolutionized milling technology through mechanizing and automating the grist mill through the use of additional machinery. And here you can see the pride in the technological innovations of the early republic see the list of subscribers to this work. Here's a history and genealogy. Here's an example of French work on the genealogy of the nobility. This is similar to and predates Burke's peerage in the United Kingdom. Travel and exploration. Many works were published on that. This is about Cook's, James Cook's second voyage. 1772 to 75, where he made significant discoveries, one of which was that he dispelled the myth of a Terra Australis, a supergiant continent in the Southern Hemisphere, because he found a lot of open ocean rather than a huge supercontinent that was believed to have existed. Johnson's Dictionary, Samuel Johnson took seven years to complete. The first comprehensive English language Dictionary used examples of words in context in the context of sentences and contains etymologies. So before moving to the next part, I must make mention of German language, printing and publishing in America in the 18th centuries. Pennsylvania, of course, welcomed a large number of German immigrants starting in the early 18th centuries into the 19th centuries, and presses developed to accommodate their needs. German language printing began in America, Philadelphia in 1728 by Andrew Bradford. This example of Franklin printed work, is a hymn book for the effort of community written by Conrad Weissel. It's actually in Roman type since Franklin didn't own a Gothic type. Germantown established, Christopher Sauer established his press in Germantown in 1738. This is the first Bible published in America in a European language. His son later did a second edition in 1763, first edition of 1743, second edition 1763, third edition 1776. The effort of press began 1745 by Johann Peter Miller. The Martyr's Mirror, a Dutch book on Anabaptist Martyrs was translated by Miller to German. And uh, this book took three years to complete and it was the largest book printed in colonial America. Okay, I see how I'm on time. Just a few more minutes. 
Okay, so the eight, we've seen types of works published in the 18th century. Now we will look briefly at the book trade and transatlantic cultural exchange. So here you see a bookseller's ad. This one advertises a set of English law statues at large, and they're suggesting it they'd be suitable suitable for a legislative body. So I don't really know if we I haven't really looked up if we have these in the assembly collection. Uh, that's something I need to look into because it may have been aimed towards the assembly to buy those. But in that vein, we have this ad from 1747 where Franklin is advertising that he has laws and institutions of the Admiralty. In fact, we do have that book as part of the assembly collection. So this book was purchased at least before 1767 when this gold stamping was placed on the assembly books. So we don't really, can't really prove that this was purchased as a result of that ad or from Franklin's as the importer, but it's interesting to ponder. Uh, a lot of, a lot of cross-cultural exchange in the 18th century. Uh, here's uh, Joseph Priestley, an English clergyman. And this is the first edition of one of his works. And so this was published in American 1796 after the English edition would have come out. Priestley later moved to Northumberland as credited with the discovery of oxygen. Here's another example of an American edition of a British work. Here's an example of the Italians picking up on Franklin's uh, invention of the glass harmonica. So this was a letter he wrote to an Italian physicist in 1769, it was published in Turin. Here's an example, here's the first edition of Franklin's experiments on electricity, published in London in 1751. There were French, German, Italian, and Latin editions subsequent to that. Here's the first French edition, 1752. We have an example of that. Here's an example of history of, or uh, there's a book on the territory, the new territory of Kentucky in the early Republic. And then a French translation of that a year later. And, and here's an example of a German translation of another Franklin work picked up in Hamburg. So while there continue to be translations in American editions of European and world publications, American publishing continued to grow to largely replace the need for British imports in the early 19th century, especially as increased mechanization and a unique American literature took hold. So thank you for attending. Do you have any questions? I think I made my time, 12.45. There were a few questions in the chat if Ellen wants to read them out to you. Okay, I will read them out. Uh, from Kathy Hale, I am assuming that Philadelphia was a major geographic place for printing. Were there other places in Pennsylvania where there were large publishers? Let's see. I'm trying to look here. Let's see if it's in the chat. Yeah, I mean, in the 19th century, you know, uh, I mean, Philadelphia was pretty small plant, I think, in the, the 18th century, Philadelphia and Germantown. And uh, then in the 19th century, of course, you start to see, especially for German printing, then that balloons into Allentown. But actually, I should go back. Lancaster was another center of printing. There was Francis Bailey in Lancaster in the 18th century. So I think Philadelphia, Lancaster, Germantown, uh, possibly Chester was an early town. But then in the 19th century, then that balloons, especially with German printing to Allentown, uh, Bethlehem, Reading, York, Harrisburg, 
and then eventually down the Shenandoah Valley, you see a lot of German printing. And But yeah, early on, probably Philadelphia, maybe Lancaster, Chester, primarily Germantown. Um, I have somebody put a comment. I assume that there were also leading and kerning spacers available as well. I think that went along with a part you were talking about in the middle there. Okay. What's with the very long titles? Is it just the style? And did the United States printers have the same problem with counterfeits that French publishers did at that time period? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why the long run on titles. That that's one of the funnest things about these books is uh, how the titles go on and on. And uh, but I don't know if, if there's any particular reason to it other than just their appreciation of language in the printed word. And uh, and then the other part of the question was the issue with. Um, counterfeits that the French publishers were having at that time period as well. Yeah, I, I haven't I haven't encountered anything very specific about Americans having problems with counterfeits. And uh, so I can't I'm sorry I can't really answer that question. I could check into it if you wanted to send me an email. Sounds good. I don't see any more questions. So I think with that we are good. Okay. Yeah, I can, um, I can finish up. Um, thank you, Nicole, for moderating those questions. Um, and thank you, Michael, for a fascinating talk and showing us all those beautiful examples of 18th century books. Thank you to all our guests for joining us today. And please stay tuned for our next session about illustrated books, which will be the end of July. The event, the event specifics will be posted on the PA State Employee Bulletin Board and, our all, and also our State Library of PA events link on our website. Um, so thank you everyone and have a great day. I do have one more question, Michael, if you can, okay. if you can stay for a second. Was there any printing in foreign languages in the 18th century? And it says, my understanding is that there was much more reading in foreign languages for educational purposes probably. You mean in America? You mean in, yes. in America other than German? Yeah, I would assume. Uh, there was some some Hebrew printing, and that but that was usually in conjunction with the Bible. You know, where there were sections printed in Hebrew within within religious works in the 18th century. Now that's primarily, or I think there's some. Uh, Almanac I was reading about in in uh, in the early part of the century that published Hebrew passages, and then the Bay Psalm book in the 17th century. But uh, yeah, I haven't encountered a whole lot of of other printing. Yeah, I, and it's not to say that there wasn't, but you know, it, it's a uh, if you see any foreign language that's printed natively in America in the 18th century, then you know nine times out of ten it's German because mm -hmm. of a large population of German immigrants. Yeah, in our state at least. Um, I noticed that many of the documents lacked page sync. Is that more a recent convention, say post 1900? What was that? Lack page? Think. Page think. Think. S-I-N-K. I'm not sure what that is. I'm sorry. Page. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what that is. Sorry. Okay. So the distance from the top of the page to the first line of the page. Oh, okay. That heading. Yeah, the running heading. Yeah, so I think what the question is that there's lacking, is that more recent? Probably to save the room. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't really know that answer. 
Yeah, the only thing I can think of is it's expensive to have more pages. So they might have been going up the page a bit more. All righty, with that then, I think that we are good to go. So thank you, everyone. Unless, unless you mean blank at the top of the page. Yeah. Yeah, some, some of this could have been during the trimming process that they, that kind of depends on how the book binder, how everything folded together and how close the book binder trimmed it. So, so I mean, that, that could be part of, you know, maybe they didn't use running he headings as much because that could all, all get cut into because each page when you folded it didn't necessarily line up perfectly. So if you had a running heading, it might look kind of odd and part of it could be cut off. So that's the only thing I can think on that topic. All righty. Everybody is saying thank you. Okay, so thanks. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.